Good afternoon. So I have to say, when I heard about your study, I was offered this panel, I thought it's a study about applying AI and automation to management in large organizations. And my first thought is, we're going to replace minimal managers with robots, right? And uh, apparently I was misinformed. That's not actually what your study came out. Walk us through the, the broad findings, how you came to them and what your lessons learned are from that. So basically what, um, what we can see, and uh, as you know, AI very often is seen as a negative perspective compared to humans. But what we see in this uh, survey that we did together with, um, with David um, is really about the fact that it's AI plus humans. And the fact that humans feel augmented and we have something, a very virtual circle where you deploy AI, therefore the teams become more effective. As they become more effective, they uh, are more confident happier and they trust AI more and therefore use it in uh, new uh, use cases. And it starts once more. And in our prep call, we talked about two specific examples of where organizations were able to leverage AI to get insights that had not sort of uh, bubbled up yet. And they, they were about use cases that I think would resonate with the Web Summit demographic. One was airplanes and the other one was booze. So let's go into those in succession. All right, Rob, you ever get on a plane, you're ready to take off, everybody seems like they're ready to take off, and the plane doesn't take off. Uh, that was how I spent five hours of a night at Dulles Airport several years ago. Good times. Yeah, exactly. So one of the reasons that uh, uh, airlines have these delays is because they, like a passenger who's supposed to be on the plane, doesn't actually make it on the plane, and their luggage is on the plane. And then it needs to get taken off. And we talked to KLM, and KLM used AI to solve this problem or address this problem. They were able to predict using AI which passengers were most likely to not make it onto the plane. And so their baggage was tagged in a very specific way so that it was easier for the baggage people to come and get the, uh, the baggage off the plane. Now, if you've ever been in the cargo hold of a plane, which I have not. I actually have, not, not stuffed into it, just a, a tour of an airplane. <laughs> Fantastic, and that's good to hear. Uh, but you know, it's actually hard for the baggage handlers to go in, crawl through the baggage, and find this person's baggage. So they, what KLM did was, in addition to sort of predicting which bag was going to be um, uh, need, need to get taken off the plane, they then use a very human additional solution to figure out what to do. They tagged it with a VIP baggage sticker so that it had the very same, it was loaded last, it had this baggage sticker, it was easy to find. And so what happened as a result of that was the baggage handlers were able to sort of get, retrieve the bag much more quickly. The pilots were able to take off more quickly and the uh, airline attendants didn't need to pacify super frustrated passengers. And, and I think that what is important here, the fact that it helps the different teams collaborate. And, and AI is a great tool because AI doesn't care about the departments, the services, whatever. What AI does, it, it goes through it, through the silos. It unsilos the companies and the corporations. And I think that it makes grown staff and crews in that case work better together. And uh, this is a great opportunity for, uh, for companies to improve. Yeah, and I, and I just add that, you know, we talk to a lot of different companies and th their various uses of, of uh, AI, but we also did a survey of more than 2,000 executives from companies around the world. And what we saw was that, like, if you had effective AI, it means it was improving your efficiency and your decision quality, you were also much more likely to be collaborative than any other company that, was, that didn't have effective AI. It's like more than 75% of organizations that had effective AI were also were found to be more collaborative as a result of using AI. Yes, and as you said, because we define the, uh, the value is it's more collaborative, there is more collective learning, there is a, uh, more morale. You have more clarity in the roles and people learn about what you do and their role, own role. And, and as we said, people are, uh, have a higher morale. So I think that the combination of this creates a real change in the organization. 
Now, the other organization I looked at in the study was Pernod Ricard, where I guess this was used to improve the process of visiting stores. Walk me through that. Yeah, so this is like the second biggest like, alcohol company in the whole world. And if, you've, if you're a salesperson for uh, Pernod Ricard, you, you have a territory and you need to figure out where to go, which stores to go to, and what you're gonna sell. AI, it turns out, turned out to be very effective in helping these salespeople figure out which stores to go to and like what to sell at each location because they had a lot of information tied to uh, zip codes and other things that like helped the salespeople tailor what the mix of things that they were recommending to a given store to sell. Yeah, and, and what is interesting that Pernod Ricard at the beginning believed that they would have a backlash. But it was the other way around because the, um, the salespeople embraced the technology as they had the feeling that it was augmenting and not replacing their knowledge. So augmenting, I think that this notion automating. of augmentation, which creates much more confidence, is a great opportunity to have a higher morale. And you could say that the morale is based on the, this higher confidence on one hand. And as you were talking about automation, to the fact that you remove low value at tasks from the plates of the salespeople. And this combination creates a real change in terms of morale. Let's say 80%, around 80% of uh, people felt that thanks to AI, the morale in their company was much higher. Yeah, and I, and I just add to that, that you know, we're, what we're talking, we did a study and the results of the study showed that like, there are a lot of cultural benefits to AI that tend to go unrecognized. But as we were developing the report, we were sort of like, you know, this is kind of like a happy story about AI. Is it, is it too happy a story? Is it? This is the one pro AI panel you're going to find at Web Summit this yeah, year. All the others to, are bad news. We need news. to convince people as well, <laughs> people who are against it. Okay, but what we found was that there was, there is a lot of mistrust in AI in the organization, and that is something culturally you need to overcome in order to get in order to use AI at all in the enterprise. But we found that once you do have, as we call it, like effective AI happening, if you have AI that works, it actually has like a bunch of salutatory effects on like the organizational culture at the team level and at the organizational level. And, and your point is very important because when we try to understand why people don't trust AI, this is basically because they don't know AI. Uh, we, we had in this survey uh, roles about, okay, why don't you uh, believe in it? Is it because of you don't understand it? You don't have, uh, let's say, you were not trained about it uh, because of the data, because of the process, whatever. No, it was really because people, we don't know it, so we don't understand it. And even in the companies where you have companies that use AI, employees love it much more. And I think this is important. And in countries like Finland, where governments have been able to really try to uh, educate people on AI, this is one of the main levers for the competitiveness of a nation. What have you learned about getting an organization to buy into this change before you can point to the positive results? Did you save this, more, this much money, this much time, had this many more sales? So very often what we see, and there, there is a question about the maturity of a company. And very often what you need to do is to start with a couple of use cases that will be seen as pilots, end-to-end, -end, but you need to move that end-to-end -end through the, uh, the company to make sure that it has impact. And then because people are looking at it, they will start it on other use cases, uh, as I mentioned. But I think that many companies today have done already a few uh, use cases. Some stayed at pilots because they were not willing or able to go through the, the silos. Some others were doing it and were already uh, good enough to become effective, um, especially in the way they were using AI plus humans in different roles. Um, this is an important uh, topic as well. But, but then the, the issue we face is that many companies need now to bring AI at the core of the, their operating model. The question is not anymore, what should I do to improve uh, my processes with AI? It's more, how should I redesign my processes to bring AI at the core of it? And it's difficult to understand the full potential of AI. 
So uh, especially for, uh, I would say, for um, uh, executives who were not trained with it. So we talked, we talked to a lot of executives who's, who mentioned developing a culture of AI in the organization. And I had the, uh, I don't know if pleasure is the right word, but you know, I, I dug into sort of the literature on organizational culture. And it is a deep, thorny, contradicting kind of uh, literature. Um, but most people have a, uh, you know, a point of view that organizational culture, just generally, is about the behaviors in the organization, the values that govern and uh, uh, drive those behaviors, and the assumptions that underlie those values. So it's a three-level uh, perspective. Was, and that point of view was sort of initially developed by Ed Schein from MIT some like long time ago. If you think about a culture of AI using that kind of rubric of three levels, there's, this, this, this is just my, I mean, this isn't in the report, but there's, it, Bonus it's, content. <laughs> it's about, you know, at the assumption level, it's about thinking about problem solving in a new way, thinking about opportunities, cultivating them in a new way. And it's like, how can AI, and, that, and there's this belief, there's this assumption that AI can help you learn, think about problems in a new way, and you'll be more competitive. And that's sort of baseline assumptions about, uh, th that exist at a, in a culture of AI. And then at the values level, well, you need to have like AI skills. You need to have, you know, these, these uh, AI deployments need to be ethical. That you need to be interested in augmenting uh, people with, their, um, with AI. And, and then at the behavioral level, it's how do you use AI to be effective in lots of different ways? How do you use AI appropriately in, in the right use cases, and how do you use AI properly with humans? So let's dig into a couple of those. Uh, the ethics of AI, one thing we, we've learned too much about the last 10 years or so, done right, it can sort of see through and route around a lot of human biases, but done right, it just hard codes them and perpetuates the problem that it could have solved. Um, did your study give any insights on how organizations can choose door number one and not door number two? So it can happen very often, but coming back to this notion of AI, ethics in AI, or AI is just a technology. And this is where I agree with you, uh, David, is the fact that it's about the people who use, develop and use it. AI is neither responsible nor unresponsible, it's a technology. And this is why we need absolutely to make sure, but, but it is a great opportunity to have AI. It is a great opportunity to come back to, okay, what are the fundamentals? What are the values that we have? Where, what is our ethics? What, what do we defend? What do we stand for? And I think that, of course, it can happen, what you're um, replying to answering your question, it can happen from time to time that, because it's not that easy. It's neither black nor white. So there is a gray area, and you never know whether you, uh, when you take a stance, whether it will be on one side or the other. It's, it's very difficult and very subtle. Yeah, if you think about like AI ethics and problem solving and problem creation, there's a lot of talk about AI is going to be creating new problems that we're going to have to address. There are other, is a, you know, AI is making worse certain problems that already exist. But there's another side to it, which is AI is actually helping us address like a wide range of problems we already have. Like just take diversity in the workforce. There are all kinds of AI solutions now that exist for AI departments in recruiting a more diverse workforce. There's more, there's more AI that helps you figure out whether or not you have a diverse workforce and what you can do about it. There's AI that helps you sort of identify where you might go to develop a more diverse work. It's, that's just like one sliver of a sliver of a problem that AI is, is helping with. But that's an old problem 
that we're just, that's become even more important and AI is helping solve it. It forces me to wonder if an AI would have picked me to moderate this panel given the uh, diversity issue here right now. Yes, absolutely. Extremely um, diverse. Yes. So, European and American. As a whole. Sure. No, but, but I think that educating the uh, C-suite is absolutely critical. They don't understand what it's about. They don't understand the full potential of AI. So very often uh, what I, I say, they should have a kind of an AI a driving license. So you have a driving license, which means you don't understand what happens in the engine, but you know how to drive your car. And, um, and it's important for them. So they, they need to understand that with AI, they need to revisit because AI is basically what? Three main things. It's the fact that it's the, uh, the ability to process big data in real time, to go to, hyper, to achieve hypergranularity and to get to be at scale um, at zero marginal cost. And, um, and, and I think that if the C-suite is able to understand that and to redesign its processes and its way in its company, then this is a source of competitiveness. And uh, we all know that upgrading and adopting AI is at the core of the competitiveness of a nation. And the other thing, we talked a little bit about this backstage, was where do humans belong in the loop? You're saying there's some things that you don't necessarily need the human to give a yes or no vote. Sometimes you want that human judgment at the start, sometimes at the finish. So we, we identified um, last year, in our report last year, a, a series of roles between human and AI from the fact that AI can support, let's say, can help you identify good uh, uh, let's say new ideas. Uh, for instance, Ben and Jerry identified through AI that they were able to, that many people were eating breakfast in songs, that many eat, people were eating ice cream at breakfast, and it gave them an idea to launch a new ice cream. So, uh, down to, uh, let's say, the um, automation where you have some mining, for instance, look at the Pilbara mine from Rio Tinto in Australia fully autonomized. I would not say automatized, I would say autonomized. And in the meantime, you have different roles where one could recommend the other decide and so on. And, and I think that it doesn't mean that any role is better than the other. What makes a difference is to apply the right role, respective roles between human and AI, depending on the use case. Okay, I think that is a, a good point in which to end. If there's one takeaway we can, I think we can all agree on, it's okay to have ice cream for breakfast. All right, thank you both. Thank, thank you. you all.